So thank you all for joining us tonight for our uh, special summer event here with Santa Clara County Library District. My name is Kelly Young and I work at the Gilroy Library. And tonight we have special guest Obi Kaufman. He has been described as many things, naturalist, artist, poet, wanderer, radical cartographer, um, so he has been born and bred in California. He attended UC Santa Barbara, and he currently lives in Oakland. He has written and illustrated for a variety of publications, and he's worked as a tattoo artist. In 2017, his first book, The California Field Atlas, was published and revealed his unique style pairing art and science through watercolor renderings of both landscape and data. The book has become a regional bestseller and is a recipient of numerous California book awards. His next book, The State of Water, Understanding California's Most Precious Resource was released in June, 2019. And last year he re released The Forests of California, which was nominated for um, the recent 40th annual Northern California Book Awards. So welcome Obi and thank you for joining us tonight. Right. Hello. Hello. How do I sound? Do I sound okay, Kelly? All right. All right. Sounds good. Uh, thank you so much for having me tonight, Kelly. Um, Santa Clara County Library District. Uh, and thank you to Booksmart in Morgan Hill. Uh, what a great little bookstore you are. Um, I am uh, in between projects, really, well, in between publication dates, I should say. Uh, the Forest of California came out in September of last year, and I will be uh, touring that book again here pretty soon in the fall. Uh, and my next book, The Coasts of California, the second in the uh, Lands Trilogy, which started with forests, moves to coasts, and then goes to deserts, uh, a uh, I, I, probably about 18 months after this next book comes out next spring, the coasts of California. So I'm right in between publication dates right now. And what I want to do this time is to give you a premiere a little bit of some uh, work that I am uh, continually investigating uh, and presenting here tonight in the form of largely a free form essay, although I do have extensive notes here in front of me uh, to uh, uh, regarding a subject that is takes a lot of uh, uh, time and uh, uh, patience to explore. Oh, I'm, I'm distracted by a red tail hawk that just landed across the street from here from me in downtown Oakland. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, uh, and that subject is the mind of the redwood forest in particular. Uh, and so I'm going to jump in with this idea about a thinking sapient uh, or, or sentient or even sapient uh, forest by presenting a bunch of slides uh, attached to my artwork here. Uh, now to begin, we have a uh, empathetic bias to vertebral, vertebral organisms. We see a face in the animal world and we can relate to it. Uh, we see eyes looking back at us and the notion of there being subjectivity is not unfathomable. Uh, it can be said that we've uh, litigiously rested our, actually we've litigiously rested conservation's case for saving the redwoods in particular. Uh, and I know that talking to Santa Clara County, we're talking about uh, uh, Santa Cruz Mountains, we're talking about Big Basin, uh, the largest stands of old growth redwood forest uh, south of San Francisco Bay uh, in existence. Uh, but we've, we've rested conservation's case on uh, saving the redwoods because of the faces, if you will, in the deep forest. And I'm talking about the spotted owl. I'm talking about the marbled murrelet. I'm even talking about the um, coho and chinook salmon or the coastal salmon. Uh, 
there's evidence that probably there was uh, these mammalian predators that now still exist, although although uh, critically endangered there in the northern redwood forest, including the Pacific Fisher and the Humboldt Martin, or the, even the Point Arena Mountain Beaver. Uh, and of course, coming soon to a Redwood National Park near you, uh, the California condor. Uh, there's a, a new, there's, there, there's a, there's, there is a, uh, a, a project. There is, there is, there is a, a ambitious schedule to get the condor uh, reintroduced to its uh, ancient habitat there in Redwood National Forest. So I, it's, it's, it's what I'm positing here today that, you know, given the ecological stress that, that our forests are now enduring across the state, that this whole strategy might use an upgrade. 1973's Endangered Species Act, of course, is what I'm talking about. This was an example, one of many pieces of legislation from the 20th century that could use an upgrade uh, based on the science and the story, that's my department, that is emerging about the interconnectedness of life and perhaps even about the nature of mind, mind as an analogous property, not only in vertebral creatures, but evidenced in mature ecosystems. Uh, biodiversity is a collective force, not only in vertebral creatures, but evidenced in, let me back up, biodiversity is a collective force, a food web structure, a nutrient supply, uh, a distribution, and a watershed remediation system that holds the mind of the forest in a homeostatic state of what can be called sanity. Can any of these species, these species I mentioned before, exist in a forest that has a sensibly lost its mind? Uh, this kind of philosophical, perhaps even metaphysical inquiry is an inroad to an inner sublimation of interconnectedness. Understanding interconnectivity is the key to our collective survival inside the many bottlenecks now observable across the biosphere. Ultimately, the opportunity to discuss the mind of an ecosystem is to look into ourselves for answers about how we operate, how we interact with the natural world, both as individuals and as societal stressors within and against the working biosphere. Exploring connectivity and inner connectivity and how those two dynamics function between habitat spaces and between subjectivities, between you and me right here, right now, whether those subjectivities are human or not, uh, leads us to uncover subtle truths uh, that will inform conservation policy in the decades and even in the centuries to come. I mean, any discussion so about so radical a notion as mind, whether applied to a forest or to any quality derived from an application of the human brain, will be most mostly an exercise in the preciseness of language. Mind exists in the overlap between the words we use to describe qualities of intelligence, consciousness, sapience, and sentience for basic spheres of understanding. Let's go back to that, that last diagram here. Uh, internalized rationalization. Mind is a tool of sense-making at the interface of the inner world and the outer world. Are these words attributable to actual, perhaps even quantifiable biological properties. Could these words describe features of the universe as a phenomenon of being that humanity has tapped into and, and is attracted to by way of our own evolutionary trajectory? Is the trajectory of all life moving towards this end goal of self-actualization? 
the question whether these qualities exist in non-human systems as evidenced in single organisms or across ecological systems and to what end does it serve us or those systems or those systems to come to this understanding are two separate issues. Uh, it is from this story, I really believe that, that an argument for something like legal personhood of watersheds will emerge. Uh, president, this president is already at work in a number of countries, including New Zealand, Canada, India, Mexico, and Costa Rica and Colombia too. Uh, the idea that a particular aspect of nature might be protected from degradation as a function of its own autonomous rights is coming. And in some respects, it's already here. Just uh, two years ago, the Yurok Tribal Court, the, 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 the tribe that has stewarded the Klamath River for thousands of years, has ruled that the Klamath River in this day and age is a legal person, that its right to run clear, clean, and cold should be protected to the full extent of the law has yet to be challenged or, or tested in, in an American court. But uh, uh, that's it's, it's, but it is by this kind of ruling that uh, uh, that encompasses all aspects of local conservation, that, that rather through a proxy of endangered species as I began this, uh, for example, that leads to an integral holistic understanding of the processes of nature as being inseparable and indeed singular. But the dangers of discussing aspects of mind as being qualities in a forest is that the human perspective is that we have a modular mind, right? Uh, that we presume to possess or carry this modular mind. It's related to the, to the brain and the vertebral nervous system uh, encapsulated in our own mortal body. And to just tr transpose those words, to transpose those words uh, that we use for what we, to transpose the words we use for what we are enabled to do through the organs of, say, a brain or through our spine, most notably the problematic idea of thinking. And then to describe what the forest does in the same terms and contexts is to tread into the dreaded and dismissible realm of anthropomorphism, turning the forest into something like us, which it very much isn't. Uh, although there are analogous properties between us and for example, trees. The danger of anthropomorphism is often attributed to minds and language used from an unhardened mind, an untrained observer, if you will. Uh, we are witnessing a shift. Uh, we think of like the hidden life of trees or by Peter uh, Wolbin and a forester or The Overstory by Richard Powers, a novel writer. Uh, both of these books are tremendously popular for good reason, uh, albeit both are drenched as my own work is uh, with a certain flavor of romanticism that may not hold up to the scrutiny of time over the decades to come. I mean, I think of uh, Tompkins and Bird's 1973 book, uh, The Secret Life of Plants, that prematurely claimed uh, evidence for plant sentience based on controversial experiments and the hypothesis that in, they had their hypothesis influenced their conclusions and they presented it as science and it set back so much of what I'm talking about by decades. It's only finally being uh, addressed by science again now, field science, testable science. I think of, uh, you know, the, the best literary evidence of this out right now is finding the mother tree by ecologist Suzanne Simard, who uh, was the basis for the char character Patricia Westerford in Richard Powers' book, uh, um, The Overstory. 
And the second, of course, is, is Entangled Life by uh, the biologist Merlin Sheldrake, who proposes the idea of mycelia. I think I have pictures of those books here. Oh, yeah, here's the books I'm talking about right now. Um, in, uh, in Samard's book, she states, and is vindicated by her decades of evidence gathering in doing so, that mother trees forest hubs are responsible for ecosystem-wide communication between plant life and fungal life. And that the protection of young and infirmed plant life falls under their charge. And indeed a sentience within the forest body that retains all of the observable, observable criteria to hold that title. So as we find this scientific language to draw parallels between what is happening now in our own minds, those processes in the living forest, we may be on the verge, verge of losing one habitat quality that presents the deepest and most pointed evidence for such inquiry, and that is old growth. The conditions for a climax community or a late seral community as, as forest ecologists and foresters call it, um, make up statewide here in California about 20 to 25% of the entire forest existing left, you know, still, still less than a third of what was here uh, before uh, it all having been harvested. That is, and most of it exists as, as, as subalpine in the Redwood Coastal Community, the USFS informs us that we have about 4% of existing redwood uh, uh, containing the structural composition to qualify as, that, as old growth. Uh, the intact canopy, the mid canopy, uh, the understory, and the soil requirements uh, to still be classified as such. And also having never been harvested, of course. Uh, in 2007, the legendary big tree adventurer Steve Sillett and Cameron Williams did a survey of nine redwood crowns and found 282 epiphytes, 183 lichens, 50 brophytes, and 49 vascular plants within the canopy. And an excellent sampling of this biodiversity that only old growth supports in such in such quantity and quality, of course. Uh, when you are in old growth, something ancient inside of you knows it. Or, or do you? Uh, Sequoia sempervirens, coastal redwood, grows so quickly with its techniques, techniques of clonal reproduction. You think of like, um, Coastal redwood has so many strategies of survival uh, that even you cut it, you know, it, it wants to, it's designed to, it wants to live for several thousand years potentially. So you can even cut down a redwood and it continues to be alive as it uh, uh, shoots up then uh, stump growth, clonal reproduction uh, to, to, and, 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 then, and then it achieves, uh, you know, one to 200 feet of height in the first uh, 100 years of its life. And so now we see all these tall forests and yet these are, so we haven't killed the trees, what we've killed is the habitat. And that's what I'm talking about here today. Uh, no one has ever seen old growth return to the forest that has been logged. Uh, it may be unreasonable to imagine it, well, uh, David Raines Wallace uh, puts it in terms of restoration. He says, um, restoration seems to me a bit like running a film of dynamiting backward, allowing the objects to reassemble. Uh, despite that, the argument of that old growth can return is imaginable, but it will not come solely by the tools of its own do, own undoing, namely the bulldozer. Old growth needs a long time and we haven't seen it come back yet. Will there be enough time for natural silt flow out of the mouth of Redwood Creek, for example, or down San Lorenzo River or, or Waddell Creek and Big Basin, for example, be established enough so salmon can return? 
as they once did before uh, dwindling numbers tip irretrievably towards the void to put it a little bit dramatically we have yet to find out if old growth conditions can return it will do so just beyond what we call the historical scale of this modern human paradigm uh, animal time and plant time work differently plant time lives by a pulse slow enough that human psychology can only understand it intellectually and simply can't apprehend it fundamentally. The only way we grasp, the only way we grasp the scale of the redwood forest is to create analogies of comparison. In this way, writer and artist Joan Dunning describes how the old growth redwoods tower over a person in the same proportion that a standard size door frame looms over a match held upright on the floor. These trees are that big, maxing out at uh, just beneath 400 feet in their maximum height towards the border in Oregon. I love, I love that, uh, that image, like the, the door frame and the matchstick. That is, uh, that is the size comparison to our little bodies. We can't apprehend its scale in space or indeed in time. Its scale shatters our animal-based time bias. Our knowledge of the forest outruns our sensory cognition and we are left with dissonance. We become numb to the presence. The redwood curtain becomes white noise across Northern California, background only. We certainly, we secretly, hmm. I mean, the deep time here is such that only a dozen generations ago for the Redwood was a different geologic era, the Pleistocene. They have one foot in geologic time, so to say. Uh, humanity, by comparison, are only a dozen generations from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution at the end of the last half of the 18th century, a period of time that was compar comparatively just last month to the Red One. So we have words like consciousness, sentience, and the rest, and we think how we, we think we know what they mean, but the only way we really, oh, here's, 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 a, here's one, of the, one of the big trees. There's the Martin and the salmon. Uh, we think we know what these words mean, but the only way we believe we are articulating their definition is by using more words. That may not be revealing of anything true of true worth, but merely cloaking essential truths with decoration. Working it all to communicate deeper truths through the clanking and whistling that is human language as it is pushed from the larynx and out through the skull in real time. This is so necessary for conversation to happen as a challenging proposition at best. I uh, like uh, French novelist Gustave Flaubert so poetic, po beautifully observed that our language is a cracked kettle on which we bang out tunes for bears to dance to while all the time we need to move the very stars to pity. So Virginia Woolf defined consciousness as a wave in the mind. But even if we're able to ride the wave, we hardly know the ocean out of which it arises. The stacked telescoping effect that is how one question leads into another in matters of ontological reality, how we know what is true how we perceive reality or how not or how not only we know what is real but how we label it as such as being real could lead down endless and frankly boring questions of why like a child unsatisfied or simply testing the adult who was questioned the question why repeated and ad infinitum leads to nowhere in the context of this discussion, the question why is best applied somewhere close to the beginning. Why make this argument, if it is an argument, for example, and not a story that the there is a mind of the redwood forest or really any old growth forest with requisite maturity and diversity 
and two, that we need to label the phenomena or the cascading phenomena as such. And so, so why are we asking this question? You know, what is what is the value of the old growth? Despite, I mean, I'm 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 trying to I'm elevating the conversation here to the uh, theoretical and getting it and, and even like divorcing it a bit from the practical, given climate breakdown and, and this sort of ubiquitous emergency, and this climate anxiety that we all feel day in and day out. Because I want to I want to explore sort of the idea always of intrinsic versus utilitarian value of something. You know, as we as we see more and more, I mean, I, I made a bunch of literary references uh, here again and again, but the idea of divorcing uh, um, even our very basic notions of nature, individual organisms as being consumers or competitors when it seems like more and more in this, and I'm sure authors like Merlin Sheldrake would agree with me here with Entangled Life, that there is this cooperative element, this ancient cooperation that we are just waking up to now. We're just finding the unbiased scientific language to even describe. And, we're, and, we, have it, and, and we have it hidden or at least I'm, I, you know, in my books, I, I, I would like to present these ideas sort of serve them up, if you will, in a way that is not rhetorically divisive or ideological. And by ideological, I just mean the, 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 the mode in which every day we are fed this, uh, or it's it's not that we're fed; it's that we are actively buying this 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 way of thinking about, uh, you know, just just to, just to say like like them us, you know. Without that, divorce divorce that from the economy of the situation. So so. To go back to this idea of, of this ecological bottleneck that we've entered into and how that is attributable to the redwood forest, we, we exist in this like solipsistic tendency, this this, this proclivity that we have to, to, to think that it might, might just all be about us. It's like the shared psychology that we that we muddle around it. It is so ingrained, it is so fundamental that a great divide has evolved over a small blink of geologic time that our species has existed between what we can call the virtual world and the physical world. And in the virtual world, and I'm not talking about virtual reality, uh, uh, but rather landscape of biases and mythologies that we have invented to rationalize our behaviors, our consumerism and our competition. We proceed as if we are masters over our own sovereign selves, which may not be the case. Uh, the truth of the physical world reveals that the, that the conscious self is a small subsystem of the left hemisphere. Now I'm just talking straight up neurophysiology. The, the conscious self is a small subsystem of the left hemisphere of your brain that creates the seamless illusion of the discernible unified experience that is you. Uh, meanwhile, there are hundreds of thousands of physiological, neurological subprocesses at work at work that govern all the systems that make you up <laughs> and are invisible to your consciousness, breathing, the speeding up and slowing down of your heartbeat, the nerve insiders that must be primed for physical locomotion, uh, balancing saliva, blood sugar, balancing upright. And the thousands of other processes that we're blocked from thinking about. It's from this perspective that, that we appear to be like modern airliners. How about that for an analogy? We're like we're like planes that can 
take care of most of the flight on their own. And then the pilot is largely unnecessary. Except it is only the pilot that understands that the outside world exists at all. So consciousness may not be a single process, but an emergent property that exists locally within and among a complex system of specialized modules. Uh, complexity is not, is not a product of complication. A watch is complicated. Complexity theory or a complex system yields emergent properties over time. Again, we're getting back to time in the old growth forest, the necessary component. Uh, so, so the modular mind is an emergent property within the complex system of, 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 of the evolution of life on Earth. It appears that beyond being a system of functional adaptation, the mind of the forest is a network of consciousness that contains evidence of sentience and even something approaching empathy. And if that were the case, there is disturb, discernment. And if there is empathy, there is sapience. And again, I point to Suzanne Samard's mother tree experiments where, where the wounded trees are, are tended to in the old growth forest by the healthier trees. It is as if the arboreal organisms themselves who are the nodes of these living networks of mind, it is through the living soils and the viscera a nearly infinite connectivity to express itself, its own agency. So of course, this goes back to the idea that it's all about the soil, it's all in the soil. 30 to 40% of all soil is fungal. 30 to 40% of all topsoil is alive. Mycorrhiza, is what is what ecologists and biologists call it foresters call it it connects 90 percent of the photosynthesizing world most plants depend on it. it's the living network biological dark matter really you pick up you pick up a couple of handfuls of that dark uh, humus in the forest that soil and there are more microorganisms in those handfuls than humans who have ever lived on the planet it's that rich that fecund and it has survived the past five mass extinctions and there's no reason to suggest that it won't survive the next five mass extinctions and i don't find that to be a very gloomy thought at all in fact i find that to be a very hopeful thought um, we understand that fungi is as much part of planthood as leaves and roots we also understand that fungal cells and human cells resemble each other in a number of core ways. There's 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 some there's some there's some, there's some uh, fruiting bodies of 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 some mushrooms there. Uh, Although these networks are of such complexity that their deep functionality may always challenge the limits of our imagination. In their study, we engage relationships that strengthen, that strengthen human ecology everywhere. So this is the whole point of this inquiry, finally. If we find evidence of intelligence in the more than human world, how does that influence our morality? It changes everything. It balances every right that we enjoy with a responsibility. It requires us of us reciprocation and even gratitude for the dynamic mechanism of resource creation that makes our lives possible. It puts us in alignment with nature and not expelled from it. So as we consider our rights in light of this new story, we wonder of what we've done and what we have to do. Uh, trending towards now simplification, fragmentation, and a general state of unhealth exacerbated by climate breakdown, bad governance, cadre of other stressors. You know, large portions of our forests are in terribly ragged shape. I don't have to 
tell you in Santa Clara and Santa Cruz County about that. We have, uh, despite that though, within this story, it is my considered hope and understanding that we have the opportunity, despite the uptick of temperature, to leave the tw- leave California's natural world in the twentieth first leave the leave the twenty first century with California's natural world in better shape than we left it at the end of the twentieth century. Our collective will is the single most important factor in making that happen. In order to generate that will, an expression of that united front, a spearhead, really, a clarion call must be answered by us, the engaged citizenry. I mean, it's possible for us to imagine that the intrinsic value of biodiversity outweighs the capital value of its dismantlement. That's how I started my last book, The Forest of California. And that by conserving the resource mechanisms of habitat biogeography, we protect the natural systems of resiliency that human society depends on. I mean, this is this is the traditions that our precious indigenous sovereignties, our uh, communities of, of native peoples across California have successfully navigated for thousands of years in this state. But we finally acknowledge that. The whole effort towards justice here that is um, fundamental. So I, I, I give you this I give you this uh, brief introduction to some of the important notions in my mind that I have about how we engage ecological services or the language around ecological services in a more meaningful and fulfilling way uh, and how we provide resilient stewardship for uh, you know towards the, the the forest's own agency and its own continued functionality as as our top mission going forward uh, we we have the money we have the people we have the understanding what's missing uh, perhaps the story to connect the two our fear in these days when there is so much ecological uncertainty in our immediate futures that there is a clock ticking counting down to something within our mortal body and we project that fear across the biosphere uh, the world won't stop. The world won't end. Nature doesn't work like that. As one aspect diminishes, another emerges. After this debate is over and this president becomes that president, and after this law turns into that law, and perhaps even after this nation turns into that nation, we will awaken to find ourselves under the canopy of a new story. And the character of that new story will be shaped by the greenery from the ground emerging now. So with that, I think that I am going to just sort of shuffle through a few slides here. And, uh, and I'm, going to, I'm going to end my presentation. I would love to um, continue this talk with it with a bit of you know with a bit of q a we can talk about anything you want it doesn't have to be about the idea specifically that i just mentioned i love to talk about my painting i love to talk about uh, my books i love to talk about my process i love to talk about what's going on in california specifically or, or if you want to talk philosophy i can do that too i'm going to go ahead and stop my share and invite kelly back on hi kelly how you doing I'm uh, doing great. Let me let me bring my uh, video back. Okay. There we go. So um, let me get you started with a question because I've talked to my coworkers um, over the past uh, few weeks or so, and um, gotten some good questions. Uh, one of great. our staff um, 
you know, was really kind of uh, excited because you are local. And so you're out there, you're in nature. And so she was really interested in um, how you're doing your artwork when you're out backpacking. So if you have any experiences, maybe places that are your favorites or just Mm. even like, how do you pack up all your artwork, art, art supplies as you go and the practicalities? a great question you know i mean I've, I've i've been a painter my whole life you know i mean when i was uh uh let, let me let me let me talk to you a little bit about about that um i'm gonna i'm gonna share this again here so let me see here where's a good picture of me painting yes this this gets to a, the heart of a lot of what i do whoops that's the wrong button there we go okay so uh, there's me in the upper left-hand corner. In the upper right-hand corner is uh, a, a several hundred, perhaps 500-year-old painting in a uh, wind cave in the San Ynez Mountains painted by the Chumash, uh, by a Chumash artist, uh, you know, before even perhaps the Spanish arrived. And it was, that was, that was, when I went to school at UC Santa Barbara, my initial inspiration for becoming an artist at all, because I didn't, I don't understand what those mandalas mean. And a lot of that specific narrative has been lost to us. But, but what I do understand is that, is that uh, what we have here is an artist uh, communicating with their community about uh, truths within the natural world based on you know, uh, cultural meaning. And, uh, and that struck me very deeply. Uh, you know, I wonder here now, like you see this image below here, Trinidad State Beach, like I wonder if I showed that image to that Chumash artist, if they would be as bewildered as I am looking at their painting, because there is no cultural uh, symbolism that we share. You know, as and you can recognize that as a beach with waves and rocks and trees and stuff, because you are drawing from this very rich lexicon of of symbols and uh, and we sh- that we share because we we engage in the same kind of uh, language stylings, if you will. You know, this gets back to I mean, it gets gets back to language in mind. You know, I mean, I could go on and on, but the, the idea that, that Noam Chomsky says that uh, we did not, humanity did not invent language to communicate, humanity invented language to think at all. So, I, 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 and, and art is a kind of language. Now, as far as like my specific painting goes, like this is, this is my palette, kind of see it. So I, I was a big uh, gallery painter for a couple of decades, like big moody oil paintings and stuff, you know, and, and uh, I, I used to like, you know, paint in a, in a dark studio. And now I am, uh, uh, you know, I got back into the, uh, the, the, greatest, the greatest pastime of my youth, which is backpacking and, and frolicking, got out of the city, you know, the, the, so, so there was a time like, you know, 95 to about 2010 when I was doing the uh, the gallery thing. And then I got back into backpacking, the passion of my youth, and found that watercolor is wonderful because it's so light and it dries so fast. So most of my paintings, like I just drew a coyote, painted a coyote here today. It's kind of, kind of in the sunshine here, but... Uh, uh, see, so like this is small paintings, small painting, you know, so, so I usually just have a stack of paintings and then, and then, um, and then brushes are pretty small and then you just need water and it works, you know, so, so that, so that, that's the incredibly lengthy tour of my studio that you just, that you just got there, but that's how I make my books, you know? And so I just have big stacks of paintings here and, um, and that's, and, and I find now that like, uh, you know, as, a, as I've gotten into rhythm of writing one book after the next, the next that, that, are, that there's really only four things I enjoy doing with my days. And I need to do all four of them every single day or I go a little bit crazy. Uh, I need to go walking for at least an hour. I need to read for at least an hour. I need to write for at least an hour. And I need to paint for at least an hour. So 
uh, usually I end up doing about two or three hours of each of those things, but each of those things is, is somehow equivalent to each other, you know, whether it's like even reading is, is, is a kind of like meditative walking just mentally, right? The miles, the printed word or, 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 or walking through, through a, a natural setting is, is it unfolds like a story. If you will, so you see, like there's there's analogies there, and even I, you know, I paint from left to right, just like I write. Um, so, um, so that 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 would be that would be uh, the uh, digest version of of my creative process, Kelly. Great. Well, I'm always happy to hear about people reading during their every day. So. Um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's exciting. <laughs> Um, we do have a, a question here from someone. Um, do you have any favorite alpine lakes in the forest mountains? And then she has another question, but let's cover that one first. So favorite alpine lakes in the forest mountains. Oh, it's nice to uh, dream about the alpine lakes. And I'm glad that that was, that was uh, uh, specified as that, right? So most of what people think of as a lake is actually a reservoir. And a reservoir is not a lake. Uh, a lake, a lake is a is a uh, natural system that is, uh, you know, al alpine would be the top of the mountain. Okay, the 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 the, the most vertical of all of the ecosystems, right? Uh, with the most elevation, often either pluvial, that is caused by rain, or glacial. And uh, if, um, and I have many of them. Uh, in fact, I would even, I would even uh, throw that into the inverse and say, uh, show me an alpine lake that isn't great. You know, in California is so blessed with them. It's called the High Sierra and it runs for almost 200 miles from from uh, from Plumas County all the way down to uh, to uh, uh, to Ashby Pass. Well, not quite down there, but but but, but well past Mount Whitney down there. Uh, so go find it. Look up uh, wilderness.net and go find one of your favorite wildernesses. Maybe it's in the McCallumy Wilderness or the Ansel Adams Wilderness or 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 even Lake Basin up off Highway 49, one of the great crowns of the Sierra Nevada. So uh, yes, Sierra Nevada is my thing. Or or if you're uh, or if you're in the Northwest, you can head on up to. Um, to the Trinity Alps and the Marble Mountains too. There's some beautiful lakes up there. That, uh, in fact, uh, one lake in the Russian wilderness is uh, a spectacular, if you're a tree lover like I am, there is a uh, single grove with the, that, uh, that tree scientists call the Miracle Mile. It's one square mile where over 20 species of conifer exist together in a moment of conifer diversity that exists nowhere else on the planet. And it's right near Duck Lake. And it is, uh, and, if you, and if you need to know your, um, or, or if you want to learn conifers, and those are your pines, your firs, your spruces, uh, uh, your cedars, um, you, that's a great place to learn and an extremely endangered place as we are uh, seeing in the era of uh, climate breakdown by way of anthropogen anthropogenic global warming. So yeah, uh, yeah, lakes. I could talk about lakes all day too. So the other part of their question is, how do you feel about the forest fires? How do you feel about <laughs> Well, <laughs> I guess give us your thoughts is a yes. better act of way. Ah, I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I mean, I write these books to um, figure out how I feel. Right. And, and there's the, there's the process of mourning. There's the process of, of uh, coming to grips with this, with an emergent reality that, that's very difficult to hold. Uh, and that reality 
has me conceptualizing that and I don't mean this is any kind of like Orwellian doublespeak, but that things are getting worse and getting better at the same time, depending on the scale in which you look at them. We are going to see incredibly bad wildfires based on uh, forest policy, which comes to us from biased science, uh, timber industry motivations, or commodification of the forest body itself, and even colonial violence. Uh, and because of that, our forests are stressed, fragmented, and infirmed, and, uh, overcrowded, diseased. And now you throw on top of that the, the kicker of climate change. We're going to go through this bottleneck. We're already inside of it. And yet, we understand that this is happening. And that is the source of our hope that we can under, we understand that there can be no environmental justice without racial justice, that we are, that we are together working on reckoning with mistakes. And we just hope that it isn't too late. Uh, and I'm thinking, namely, of, of 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 not respecting fire as a tool, not respecting fire as a uh, renewer, uh, not respecting fire as a character that will not be denied in the California ecosystem for the past six million years or so that California has resembled its current tectonic configuration, really, where the, the, the uh, California floristic province has really co-evolved together to make this very special place, this evolutionary island, if you will, as it's been called many times. Fire is as important as water as necessary and is omnipresent and denying it for so long and destroying the living body and the mind as we discussed earlier of the forest for so long we are we are and will it have to endure that reckoning for some time to come and yet you know, as I state again, we understand what is happening. So we've got we've got uh, we've got initiatives. We've got an infrastructure bill by the current presidential administration is calling for the rebuilding of something called the Climate Conservation Corps. Uh, it was what's called uh, uh, Civilian Conservation Corps in the '30s. It's the New Deal proposition. Now we are uh, now we're talking about building a whole trade skill out of ecological restorationism, which is uh, a fantastic idea, especially in a community like California with a $3 trillion GDP. We can apply all that money and really bring organized labor into the urban wildland interface, for example. We can do whatever we want. Let's just do it by inventing by, by, I'm sorry, by recognizing fire as a omnipresent character that will not be denied, will not be denied to such a degree that it is not implausible to say, and I do say in my forest books, and remember I'm an artist so I can say things like this, trees themselves in California are fire held in stasis before they burn. So when you look at the trees, you are looking at fire before it happens. So the trees understand this. Every single arboreal habitat system in California either is adapted to fire or is even dependent on fire. And by, by fire, I mean the regular return of a regime and a naturalized system that is uncorrupted by pollution or invasivity or uh, 
you know, a number, a number of other factors. Usually, usually ecologists call it hippo, which is, which is, uh, which is harvesting, invasivity, population pollution, and overharvesting, which is HIPPL. Uh, but uh, you know, that, so 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 getting the forest's mind together, allowing it to do its thing, it will take care of itself, and we can adjust or we can live with or free from the regular return of catastrophe like we are seeing all the time now so that would that so so i am writing a book about fire <laughs> and uh that'll be here that'll be here a couple of years from now i think <laughs> i'm gonna need to think that one out for a bit looking forward to it and i'm sure Thank it'll you. Be just as timely um once it once it's published um thank you so we have a couple more questions here. Um, okay. Do you see do you see diverse groups of people on your backpacking journeys? Oh, what a wonderful uh, question! Uh, trans opening the discussion to a tra uh, transsectionally uh, between different types of people, different types of people, as if there's more than one, uh, but. Uh, but there certainly are. We need to acknowledge uh, cultural, economic, racial differences. It's it's past too. Uh, now now on my journeys, yeah yeah you know I mean I, I go over I go all over California and 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 and, and I, I don't just like spend all of my time in the wilderness. I guess that's the question. Uh, but you know, but in my audiences from Fresno to Lake Tahoe to Arcata down to San Diego, Los Angeles, Santa Barbara. Uh, I, I, I see uh, a, a great diversity. I would say it's improving, but I think I think there is a uh, there's a long way to go. And I, you know, I would love to be part of a discussion like that. And and. And in that discussion, I am sure that I would do more listening than talking, or at least I hope I would. Yeah. And I, I think also probably with the pandemic and people kind of being forced to maybe stick close to home or be outdoors, that probably has maybe encouraged a lot mm -hmm. of people to go hiking or go explore their backyard wilderness. Um, mm -hmm. So I, th I think that has probably encouraged people as well. Um, and I, I see another question here, and it's about your artwork. Your paintings are exquisite. The painting of the Thank redwood you. forest you showed earlier nearly brought me to tears. It was so beautiful and reminded oh me of so, <laughs> I know it's a lovely comment here, reminded me of so many wonderful hours spent in Humboldt County. Do you sell your prints? Uh, I don't, I don't sell prints. I'm, um, let's see here. It might be this one. I don't have the uh, production infrastructure to do that as yet. Now I do sell the originals, and I uh, if if uh, I can I can reproduce any of the originals if if that if the originals already sold, uh, and uh, or I can paint any of your favorite scenes if you have a photograph or whatever and i can go big too I, I love to make big big paintings so you can email me at coyote and thunder at gmail.com and let's talk about it yeah that's that's really quite a bit of my bread and butter really thank that's you for good. asking good. yeah so um Another question here is, um, which environmental or charitable organizations do you think are doing some really standout? Uh... Oh, you're, you got muted again there, Kelly. Um, now, uh, there are many of them. <laughs> uh, I am a big supporter of the land trust movement. I, I find that model to be uh, worthy of uh, help um, and and of, of, of you know the, by supplying this not only connective inholdings between habitat 
spaces and managing them uh, through the ingenious invention of the con uh, the uh, the easement, the conservation easement, uh, which is uh, one of the greatest legal tools that we've invented in the past fifty years to protect habitat space. Uh, but they're, but they're also like this whole like cellular management thing there in Santa Clara. Uh, you've got um, the Peninsula Open Space Trust, which was let's let's talk about just local organizations there in Santa Cruz and and, and uh, Santa Clara counties. Uh, I've been working with uh, Semper Byron's Fund. Uh, the Semper Byron's Club was one of the first um, organizations, as such. Uh, that was, but gosh, it's almost 120 years old now. Uh, the Semper Byron's Fund is working very hard at uh, forest recovery with Big Basin State Park. Uh, I also the uh, Peninsula Open Space Trust is. Um, uh, is Peninsula Open Space Trust has successfully assisted in the preservation of Coyote Valley, which is that long strip, this long stretch of road between San Jose and um, uh, Morgan Hill, which is uh, a huge migration corridor between the Diablo Range uh, to the east and the Santa Cruz Mountains to the west, which you know, for Tule Elk and all manner of creatures. And, and uh, it looks like the city of San Jose has has, has uh, decided to let them manage it, manage it. And I think they they acquired it as well. So that is very exciting news. Um, so yeah, check out uh, Peninsula Open Space Trust uh, and Semper Byron's Fund. Those those would be the two. Uh, th there are a number of other there are a number of other ones working in your in your neighborhood too. Um, but you can certainly start there. Oh, Bay Nature, if you want something a little bit different, I would recommend the magazine Bay Nature, which is, a, which is doing great work as far as uh, uh, communicating good science and a lot of good art there too, um, you know, for, for issues affecting the San Francisco Bay. Um, I heard somebody say the email again. My email is coyote and thunder, three words, all one word, at gmail.com. All righty, Kelly. Any more questions? So I think um, I think that's all the questions. Someone did ask for us to type the email again. So was it Coyote and Thunder? Coyote and Thunder at Gmail. Thank you for doing so. Coyote and Thunder at Gmail dot com. Yeah, that's so, right. So um, I just want to mention again, if anyone wanted to purchase purchase a copy of um, any books. By Obi Kaufman, they can contact Booksmart at Morgan Hill. Yes, please support your local bookstores and, and your local we libraries. I really want to thank Obi Kaufman. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate having you here this evening virtually with us. And thank you so much. Um, I apologize for the sound issues <laughs> and the technical issues of me keep freezing, but thank you all for bearing with us. And any last words? Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you. Have a great evening. Goodbye, everyone. everybody. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>